don't know. I think it's the wink that gets me every time. But you know what? <laughs> this show is much better looking this week. Why? There's no Gary Streisky. Scooby McGezza, Jason Fitz. This is the kickoff presented by Ram Trucks. And you know what? It's, it's big shoes to be filling. You know, Gary, not to, not here this week. But I, I feel like we're going to bring it. I brought big shoes for it. You, you feel me? You did bring, like, very stylish <laughs> shoes, too. You know, that Scooby always uh, Scooby always has the drip going, as the kids say. It's a... <laughs> Huge weekend. Look, I'm going to pretend not to be distracted for the next 30 minutes because I'm wearing the Raiders logo on my chest. My God, it's a massive weekend for all things in my life with the Raiders playing on Sunday night with a win there in oh, yeah. game. Oh, but yeah. it's also a big weekend this weekend for college football fans as they get ready for a national championship. Like, there's just so much on the board. This Scooby. is the week we've been waiting for. And isn't it crazy how... Everything just ended up working out to be Alabama, Georgia, as we all could have predicted at the start of the season. So we get to see those two teams match up again. Some people don't like the matchup. Me, personally, I love it because when the Celtics were the ones going to the championship every single time that year, was everyone complaining? No, they're just happy to see a team in the championship. Which, by the way, we'll promote this several times, but if you're watching digitally, you can watch us 7 p.m. on Monday with a whole slew of digital hosts giving you all of the coverage you could ask for for the national championship. Scooby, you're right. Clearly the two best teams in the country are going to be taking each other on in Indianapolis. We're going to be freezing our grape nuts off, but we will be watching college football in all of its greatness and glory. This moment, this time, what I control is what I do. Not how I feel, but what I choose to do. And they throw deep to an open receiver. Touchdown, Alabama. We're just warriors, man. We fight to the end with everything we do, man. That's why we're going to win in that and repeat. We have one more opportunity to see what we can do, and I know we'll play a really good team, whoever it is. This team will be defined by what? What we do now. Georgia, the whole night through. Manhandling Michigan, dominating them from start to finish, and booking that revenge tour matchup with Alabama and Indy. I mean, if that doesn't get you pumped up, let's talk all things college football. Natty with our buddy Ryan McGee. What it McGee, is. by the way, rocking the Star Wars shirt, which is important because let's remember, Boba Fett's going to join us later you know, in the show. He got the so, theme right. You know, oh. What do you mean he's going to join us? Boba Fett's not on right now? Where the hell is Boba Fett? <laughs> well, there's only... like I, brought all, I brought all my stuff. I just, uh, look. Listen, listen. Um, we appreciate the the energy and the enthusiasm, but that... So, so settle down now. That, that That's for later. It, no, Scooby's too cool. Like, I'm... I'm, I'm uh, what are you... Are you drinking out of a Jabba the Hutt cup? Like, where does this... Where is Boba Fett? You've got a large collection to start. Can we see that again? Like... It, it, oh, and, oh, it's because hey, I'm old. It's, if you're old and you were born in the 70s like I was, then, you know. Oh, then you, man. You, Look at all the stuff you got behind him. He's got the stuff. McGee, yeah. like the world the doesn't saber? really have time for this story, but I'm going to make sure I'll, I'll do this as quickly as I can. When I was a little kid, my mom had this record player, right? And we weren't allowed to use it. My brother and I weren't allowed to use a record player. And uh, we did. My brother used it and broke the needle. And then he tried to, like, put it in there where, you know, mom would find out. Mom finds out. Mom comes home and she's like, hey, I told you you can't use it you broke something that's meaningful to me I'm going to break something of equal value of each of yours to teach you a lesson so she went and found all my brother's records and broke them right but then she went into my room and she grabbed my Millennium Falcon like I was born in 77 she no, 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 my, no. my Millennium Falcon she throws that thing on the ground it bounces she steps on it doesn't crack that Millennium Falcon was indestructible she ended up throwing it in the in the trash but you know that okay anyway okay. they're telling me off I got to go off the rails now <laughs> should we get Dr. Say, Phil is Dr. Uh, Phil going to join no, Boba I just, Fett I and talk to you the, about your, your, your past and I, is everything okay <laughs> that's, that's your job uh, you know, okay oh, if you think my childhood scarred me from Star Wars let's talk about scar tissue left over from the SEC championship game that's called Ooh. a segue, ladies Ooh. and gentlemen. That's, that was amazing. Right, that's so amazing. Is what George that was, is yeah. still scarred from getting thumped. Why is it going to be different this time? Because they lost the game. I mean, I, I think that, you know, you ask Nick Saban about that. You know, you think of all the national championships that Nick Saban has won, I think he's had two undefeated teams, you know, including last year in, in the shortened season. So I think getting a loss on the docket, is, it, although it, it's terrible at the time, certainly in a, in a conference championship game, but, you know, you saw the look on Nick Saban's face after Alabama lost Texas A&M. He was disappointed, but he kind of dug it because pain makes you better. And, and so I think that you, you look at and see how Georgia rebounded against Michigan. I think getting a loss out of the way 
Oh, Kirby Smart's got just enough Nick Saban in him to know that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Man, in their game, Bryce Young really cemented his Heisman candidacy, and it was like his coming out party to guarantee and take that award. He had 421 passing yards. That's a record, unlike anything that we've ever seen. So how do you think Georgia is going to try and slow him down now that they're going to see him for a second time? Well, pressure's not enough. I mean, that, that's what they learned in Atlanta. And I was uh, – Marty Smith and I were standing on the sideline for, for most of that game. And they got a little bit of heat on him, but not a lot. So pressure's not enough. Trying to influence what he's doing is not enough. Listen, the play that won him the Heisman, in my opinion, was that 1987, you know, that, that option pitch yeah. you know, that he had mm. early in the game that set up a couple of great touchdown passes. And to me, that was the perfect example of you applied pressure – you know, you altered the play, and he still burns you for it. So it's not enough to chase him. You got to knock him down. And they came close. I mean, they got with the several defensive players told me this week, we got within inches of a couple of big sacks, zero sacks, not a lot of pressure in that game, no tackles for losses. So it's not enough to chase him. You got to actually catch him and knock him down if you, yeah. you want to make a statement. And I think that's what they're scheming for. So let's look at the other quarterback. Stetson Bennett obviously had a couple of forgettable interceptions, but he's coming off of a great semifinal game. So what Stetson need to do to channel some of that semifinal energy into this game? You got to spread the wealth. I mean, that, that, that's what they were doing. You go back and look at the numbers, and a lot of this was, was predicated upon the fact that they lost JT Daniels, you know, essentially in week three. But beginning of the year, they were running the ball like 80% of the time. And everybody's like, oh, it's Georgia. And in Georgia in the last 15 years. And so if you see what that offense was then versus now, it was about 50-50 split between running the ball and, and throwing the ball against Michigan. And that gives Stetson Bennett time. That gives Stetson Bennett the confidence that, well, okay, now, now we're going to go deep. And, and you, watch, you look at the number of guys who caught passes in that game. It was a lot of New England Patriots extended handoff, you know, <laughs> stuff in the flat and in the middle. And so I think that's what we're going to see a lot of if Stetson Bennett's given a chance. But he has to stay upright. You know, that was part of the problem in Atlanta was you, you can be as good as you want, but even if Tom Brady's sitting on his butt, he can't complete passes. And so they got to protect him. Yeah, football is a team game, clearly, and we've talked quarterbacks. So, give us a player to watch on both teams. One guy, go. Well, oh, uh, I'm that talking about spreading the wealth. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm talking about spreading the wealth on offense. You know, Brock Bowers, that, that dude, he's open, and yeah. he's a freshman. And, 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 you know, when Florida had Alabama on the ropes, it's usually was because of Kyle Pitts. And, and when Georgia uh, is moving the football, it's usually because of him. Nick Saban said, Forget that he's a freshman. This is one of the best athletes in all of college football. He's mm -hmm. all American. And the kid was in history class, you know, in high school, like eight months ago. And, and so to me, uh, it's spreading the wealth. And, and Brock Bowers, to me, is the guy that you've got to, uh, got to keep an eye on. And then for Alabama, and listen, I'm talking about Stetson Bennett, the fourth he of the country club name, got to stay on his feet. And uh, Will Anderson is the best defense player in the country. And uh, I live here in Charlotte where they award the, the Brock, Brock Nico Nagurski Award. Uh, he won that. And uh, to me, I think Will Anderson was the best college football player in the country, period, this season. And uh, I watched him, again, stand on the sideline for a lot of SEC games this year. He dictates everything. Even if the numbers aren't there, everything had to work around him. So if he knocks Mr. Bennett on his butt a couple times, uh, this game could get out of hand quick. All right, let's take a look at Built for Success, presented by Ram Trucks. This is where we take a look at somebody built for success. It's the Natty. They're both built for it. Yeah. Saban seeking the seventh national championship with Alabama, eighth title overall. Kirby Smart 0-4 as Georgia's head coach versus Bama. So, let's take – we'll start with you, Ryan. You're the guest. I mean, which team is built for success Monday night? Which team's going to take it all? Who wins? Listen, we, we forget now because of one bad night. Georgia was the number one team in the country for most of the season. Uh, they looked really good last week. And, and it's hard to beat a team twice, no matter who you are, even if you're Alabama. Yeah. So uh, I say go dogs. And, uh, and you know, I, I said go dogs in Atlanta a month ago, and I was horribly wrong, as was the rest of the world. <laughs> uh, but in this case, I, I think they got their swag back, and I think they got that loss under their belt. And, again, getting smacked in the mouth sometimes is a wake-up. And I think that's what happened to those guys in Atlanta. 
Fitz will tell you, when they were going to face off in the SEC championship, I was one of the few people that was screaming, go Alabama, it's road true. tide. It's true. They are the ones built for success. Jameson Williams will be a huge reason why. If you take a look at that tape in that game against Georgia, they really utilized his speed on the outside, gave him some uh, bubble screens, some end arounds, and he's somebody that can really hit the corner and take advantage of the DBs. Now, the weak spot, the spot where Georgia is a little bit more susceptible to being attacked is their secondary. They got that strong run game, and Jamison Williams was killing them in that game, and I think that's the reason why Alabama is built for success. Roll Tide! All right, well, look, I would love to think that Georgia wins this game, but I think there's a key to this game, and I'm going to say when it comes to built for success, who's going to win? It's Alabama, but one thing's going to look drastically different in this game, and it's going after Bryce Young, because if you look back at the numbers, to the point that you made, McGee, they didn't do a great job of getting him down. Well, they did when they blitzed him. His, his completion percentage dropped to 40% when he was blitzed in that game. The problem is Georgia didn't blitz him a lot. I think they will in this game. My problem is, if I know that, then Nick Saban knows that, which mm. means he will be ready for that blitz. I don't think it's Jamison Williams that's going to go off. I think it's one of the young guys that we haven't been talking about Without Mechie in the game, there's going to be opportunity. They're going to do everything they can to stop Williams. That's going to open up other opportunities. Big plays win this game for Alabama in my mind. Unfortunately, I will say, that too, I'll steal this from Desmond Howard on College Football Live the other day when I was working with him. said, look, these two rosters are so even, it's going to come down to coaching. And if it comes down to coaching, I ain't betting against Nick. I'm just saying. I, I mean, that, that, that much I know. Ryan, you are the best. You are forever the Luke Skywalker and Han Solo in our oh, life. Man, that was great timing. Did you please tell Look Boba Fett I thought he was going to be on the show and he wasn't? No offense, guys. <laughs> yeah. I'll be watching Boba Fett. Oh, May the wow. force be with you, good sir. Yeah, that is amazing. Don't forget to check out the game coming at you Monday night. The national championship 8 p.m. Eastern. You can check it out on ESPN. Stream it live in the ESPN app. Also, if you're on any of the digital formats, Scooby and I will be hanging out with a whole Woo! host of hosts starting at 7 p.m. Eastern for your pregame show. You can get all the action right there. In the meantime, let's get some of the action you need to know about the action from our buddies at BET. Let's see what they think from the national championship. Tyler Folgeman, Joe Fortenbaugh here in Las Vegas, studio of BET, getting ready to flat break down Monday's national championship matchup, all SEC, Bama and Georgia. Joe, you may remember these teams met in the SEC title game a few weeks ago. Georgia installs a six-point favorite then. They're now just a two-and-a-half-point favorite. Now, you think the bookmakers made an appropriate adjustment? Absolutely. I mean, let's go back to that game in which Alabama beat Georgia. A lot of people would look at it and say, well, if Bama beat Georgia, how come they're not the favorite this time around? You have a minus six scenario. How far do you want to go? Six, seven points? It was a convincing win. But if you go any further, you're going to have the professionals come flying in and steamroll you with Georgia money, which means you're going to have a liab liability on your hands okay. in that scenario. Now, what's been interesting is the fact that they opened two and a half. Then it went up to three Georgia money uh -huh. early. Now it's back down to two and a half as Alabama hit the money, <laughs> hit the market in the money a little bit quicker than some may have expected. So this has been a very nice chess match so far. All right. So the, the side may be a little feeling out process yeah. as to how you want to go does the total maybe give you more conviction how you want to play this game absolutely I would think the opposite from what we saw in the first game yep. is going to happen I'm going to play under 52 total points here now that SEC championship game had a closing total of 48 and a half so we've seen a, an adjustment north of about three and a half points I think it's too much, quite frankly, presenting value in the under. Georgia was surprised by what Alabama did. They went up tempo and they threw the ball all over the field. That is how you attack the Georgia defense. It forced them to make substitutions. And then Alabama would speed it up to the point where Georgia couldn't get their stars back on the field. You're not going to get surprised like that again. I think Georgia's defense gives us a much better effort this time. Alabama's defense, a phenomenal unit as well. That should get some stops. And remember, no John Mechie for Alabama. Yep, yep. Six catches for 97 yards and a touchdown in that SEC championship game. But I would like to know, more importantly, what do you think about this? Well, Brother Fortenbaugh, you make a good point that it's reasonable to expect a better effort from the Georgia Bulldogs. However, ah, here it is. Nick Saban is an underdog in this game, and there are few things that are as reliable as betting on Nick Saban when he is an underdog, which rarely happens. The last three instances, and in, in fact, you have to go back to 2009, which was the SEC championship game against Florida, 2015, a regular season game against Georgia, and then, of course, just a couple weeks ago in the SEC title game against Georgia. Bama not only covered, but won all three of those games outright, Joe, by 19, 28, 
and 17 points You have them all of this memorized? You've been talking about Alabama all week. I'm a not? professional. It's my job to memorize these things. <laughs> They're right here. It's right there. Uh, no, but, I mean, this is Nick Saban getting points, now being able to legitimately sell to his squad. We're being disrespected. They don't believe in you out there. You just beat this team by 17, and you are literally the betting underdog. I like Nick Saban being able to not sell rat poison. This is like cotton candy to get his team all jacked up to go out there and win yet another national title. So that's the way I'm looking at the side. I will take Bama plus the points. I'm playing Bama on the money line as well because I expect this trend, which dates back to 2009, to continue for Saban and the Tide. If you're not interested in side and total, there are other ways to oh, wager yes, on the are. national title game. We're still waiting for player props, but how about first team to score? First half lines, team totals. I like getting involved with team totals. I think that's one of the easier ways to determine how two teams will interact on a field when they get involved. You mentioned you like the under for the game, so is there one side in particular do you think is going to drive that total under? Staying away from that, but I okay. would look at Georgia minus one in the first half. Essentially, it's a toss-up. They did jump on Alabama the first time around before Bama settled in and really hammered in there in the second quarter. I think with the adjustments that are made, that doesn't necessarily happen again. So of everything you just saw on that graphic, I would be looking to Georgia minus one in the first half. Yeah, and I would play Despite those. Despite everything you just laid out <laughs> about Nick Saban as an underdog. I would be on the other side of that. I like Saban in the first half because now he has those three or four extra days coming off the Friday semifinal game to a Monday national championship game. When Saban has, Saban has more time than six or seven days, I trust him to develop a better game plan that's going to kind of startle a Georgia team early in this. So I would play Bama in the first half. I want Bama every which way you can. And I would play the Georgia team total under because I just don't think Stetson Bennett inspires me to exceed expectation against what is Probably an underrated Bama defense when everyone just talks about how great Georgia's been all year long. Alabama is minus 105 to grab the first score. I'd have to imagine you're all over that as well if you like him to play him on the money line. Absolutely. All right. All right. Those are our thoughts. Brother Fortenbaugh, brother Fulgham. Fitzy, what do you oh. think? National title yeah. matchup on Monday. ESPN, Bama, and Georgia, part two. I do like brother Fortenbaugh, brother Fulgham. Feels <laughs> good. Feel like I'm going to church. Those guys always do great work. Uh, this is what I know. There's a lot of games to watch this weekend and the longest NFL season we've ever seen at this oh, point is everybody's yeah. got 17 games. There are some big games, obviously Chiefs Broncos. That's a Saturday game. Keep that. Keep your eye on that one, not just because it's on ESPN, because it'll also matter to the playoff seating. So a lot of big games there to yeah. watch. And that's not forget Patrick Mahomes is 12 and 0 in road games and road division games in his career. So uh He's, he's looking good for him to play in that, that Broncos game. Yeah, uh, that's why I love this conversation of like, well, you don't want to face – I don't want to face the Chiefs. That's all I'm saying. By the way, that Sunday night game, uh, hopefully I remember. It depends on how much oh, I drink Oh, what Sunday happened to that Sunday day. night game? <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Let's get you to the playoff picture for the NFC first. Uh, the Packers we know locked in as the one seed. Uh, there's not as much movement possible here. Uh, not as much suspense going into it, but there is an in-the-hunt situation. And it really comes down to a couple of games to note. Number one – 49ers at Rams. Are you ready for a, a crazy piece of information here? Go ahead. I'm here. The it. next time that the Rams beat Jimmy Garoppolo will be the first time that the Rams have beaten Jimmy Garoppolo. Wow. Learn that from DeMarco Farr, the great wow. ESPN NL, uh, LA analyst on Spain and Fitz, the radio show you should listen to 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern on you ESPN do a Radio. Job on that now, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think. We've got to remember that the Rams have been up and down, and we have no idea what the uh, quarterback situation is going to look like for the 49ers. Jimmy G may be healthy enough to play. We don't know. Trey Lance has taken some steps forward, but there is not an easy solution in this game if you're the Rams and you're looking at two quarterbacks with two very different styles that you're prepping for. Uh, I'll be one of the few to say it, and I said this to you, uh, uh, to Shea, on Monday. I believe in the Rams. I think the Rams are a team that can definitely pick it up. Uh, that defense, it's, it's, it's so talented. You have a guy like Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey. Then you got Vaughn Miller, who seemed to be starting to sink in with what this defense is doing. He made a game-winning play last week for this team. Then you got Odell Beckham Jr. getting used to things on offense. It's Stafford that's the X factor. But – is he going to be able to clean it up in time? They have a head coach who can help do that. Yeah, and we're talking about a 12-4 and four team like they're 9-7. and seven, So let's not get yeah. it twisted. Now, all of this also has results uh, that impact the Saints and Falcons. Because remember, if the Saints can beat Atlanta and the 49ers lose, the Saints get into the playoffs. And Scooby, quickly, what I think is amazing here is that 
The Saints have done all this with essentially no quarterback. I mean, yeah. Taysom Hill has not been the answer. Jameis Winston got hurt. Like, they have absolutely had no quarterback, and they still have a scenario that can get them into the playoffs. Yeah, the, when you look at Taysom Hill's statistics right now, he has one of the worst QBRs in his starts. He ranks 34th out of qualified quarterbacks mm. every time that he starts a game for this team. Now, the thing that's really helped out Taysom Hill is that defense. They're – they're allowing just about 12.5, uh, under 13 points per game when he starts at quarterback. So all they need him to get is maybe one touchdown and a couple of field goals, and that's been enough for him to get them a win because he is 6-2 and two when he starts for the team at quarterback. So who you got in this? Like 49ers, Rams, who you think wins that game? Rams. I, I, got, I got the Rams I got also. the Rams. So then Saints, Falcons, who you got? I'm going to go with the Saints. I think that defense can still play to the level that they need them to. That would put the Saints in the playoffs. I think the Falcons are actually going to beat the Saints. And as a wow. result, the 49ers will still back in. What do you to think the, the Falcons can do well that will negate what that defense does well? Uh, Matt Ryan is getting, does not get the love that he deserves. And it's not really what I think the Falcons can do well against that defense. It's that I don't think the Saints are going to be able to score the way that they need to. Like, this feels like a 13-10 ugly sort of game that belongs to the NFL. Let's look at the AFC also. Now, we all know what game I'm going to get to. But first, <laughs> let's talk about the Colts because this is interesting here. The Colts haven't won in Jacksonville since 2014. That's insane. Yeah, but the Jags suck. So, like, I'm sitting here looking at it saying, if I'm the Colts, I got to feel good about this one, right? Colts win and they're in. If they lose to the Jags, things get complicated, but they win, they're in, right? Yeah. And I think they're going to win this football game. Oh, I mean, they're a 15 and a half point favorite, 15 point favorite. Uh, that is a pretty big difference when you talk about what Vegas thinks between these two teams and uh, what it actually is. So I think the Colts are definitely going to get the win. Now, if the Colts lose by some phenomenon, Fun, f some miracle, if the Colts lose, Go ahead. what happens? And this? the Ravens beat the Steelers. I will already be drunk when the Chargers Raiders kick off because there's nothing to play for at that point. The Raiders are in without even needing anything. But what's interesting here is that the Raiders Chargers flex to Sunday night. We all know that's a game I care about. Obviously, uh, I've got a Raiders tattoo for the love of God. I can't, I can't got not the Raiders buy shirt on. Right, yeah, like I have more Raiders swag than any grown man should have. Uh, I, I, but I don't believe the football gods love me enough to let me have nice things. Like, I, I will tell you this, though. The Raiders, this is the identity of the Raiders. They keep it close. They play it ugly. They don't give up big plays, and they don't get big plays. They're just sort of there, and they stick around, and then Derek Carr finds a way to win. And that, that has worked for them for three straight weeks. If, that, if they're capable of doing that against the Chargers, it's going to be big. The biggest test to me is it's at Allegiant. Will Vegas have a home field advantage at Allegiant? Because so far this year, they haven't had the advantage they want noise-wise. Yeah, and I think something you said off-camera to me was really hard-hitting. If Derek Carr wins this game for the Raiders, then he's probably going to get re-signed and be their quarterback for, what, the next six, seven years? But if he loses this game, you expect, and I agree, that this team is probably going to end up moving on from Derek Carr. So a lot's going to be at stake on Sunday night. Yeah, mostly my health is going to be at stake. <laughs> Either way, I'll probably still be drunk by the time we get to the national championship game Monday. It's just, will I be crying tears of joy or tears of sadness? Don't forget, you've got the Saturday NFL doubleheader on ESPN and ABC. First, you got Chiefs at Broncos, 430 Eastern, followed by Cowboys and Eagles. A lot on the line there for the Cowboys, too. Both games on ESPN and ABC. All you got to do is sign into your cable provider if you're watching in the app. Fun way to do it. Joba had many vessels. We've got a lot of ground to cover if we are to keep his empire intact. I can make the rounds without you. Jabba rarely left his chambers. Jabba ruled with fear. I intend to rule with respect. If I may. Speak freely. In difficult times, fear is a sure bet. I'm telling you, like, there are just times you're watching something and you get goosebumps. That's me. Like, I'm a grown-ass man that was getting all kinds of emotional watching the book of Boba Fett. Like, this is awesome. We are joined by Tamara Morris Morrison. Man, I can't calm down. Like, I'm talking to Boba Come Fett. Down, this Jason. is making my day, this brother. This is awesome. This is awesome. Hey, we appreciate you joining us. So, walk that. me through your process, though, because, like, this is such an iconic role. How did you prepare to play someone so iconic? Uh, well, I went to makeup. I needed a little bit of makeup to tell the story. Look, I'm not the writer. I had to trust Dave Filoni and John Favreau, the writers. But, but uh, 
a little bit nervous because it was a an honor. It was a privilege for me to be called back. But I was blessed that uh, I played Django Fett. Boba Fett is the clone's son. He had to look like this, I guess. So, uh, so they called me back in. So how lucky, how fortunate. And from the year 2000, I think it was, the Attack of the Clones. So 20 years later, here I am, like father, like son. We know how passionate Star Wars fans are. And when you ended up returning to the live action as Boba Fett and the Mandalorian, from your perspective, what was the initial response from everybody when they got to see you? Well, I remember going on set the very next day and everyone was going, congratulations, congratulations. And I was going, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> what did I do? What happened? Congratulations. The fans love you. Said, oh, my God. Thank Christ for that. Well, thank Christ. Um, yeah, you know, I had a warm response, a genuine response. The fact is we hadn't seen this guy for a long time, since 1980. The fact is also that he wasn't seen that much over the yep. saga, maybe yep. six scenes. The big thing, of course, he captured Han Solo. So I think that's what gave him a little bit of respect. And then he kind of got nudged into that Sarlacc pit where I've been trying to get out for a number of years. And here I am now on the kickoff show with Jason and Scooby. Hey, what about the big game? Let's talk about real stuff. We've got the big championship game next week, isn't it? Alabama, Georgia. Who you got? I mean, who does Boba Fett think is going to win the national championship? you got to tell us. Is it, is it Alabama or Georgia? What do you think? Alabama, Georgia. Well, um, look, I'm right into the game, too, and I try and watch it where I can. I've just been on a bit of a break at the moment. I, I didn't like the, the way Alabama beat Georgia that uh, last time out. So I'm going to go with the underdog, Georgia. I think oh, they've got to work on their defense. They've got to, up, they've got to upset Bryce. They've got to keep on him. They've got to jump over the line or do something, upset him. They might have to use a little bit of dirty tactics, but their defense game has got to come right, and I'm going to go for the underdog. And I just think, well, Bryce has had such a brilliant uh, year. He won the big trophy. And, uh, you know, they've got to sustain that. But, yeah, here we go. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, let, let's move to your – I got to ask you because, you know, we just came out of the holidays, right? Everybody's, like, taking a little time off training. But you had to train like crazy for this. Yes. So what kind of regimen did you do to get ready to play Boba Fett? Like a football well, workout. I, it, 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 it pays to do a lot of training, so when you actually get to do the fight scenes, people only see the 30 or one minute segment, but it takes it takes a good uh, good long day to actually sustain the, the fight scene. So I'm getting a little bit more mature. So I, I actually got my friend in who used to be a wide receiver from Tampa. Uh, he's been a great friend of mine since six days, seven nights. Uh, we were, he was a stuntman on there, so I trained with him. We do a little bit of cardio, do a lot of light weights. We do a lot of stick work. I was staying in Hermosa Beach, so I went down Hermosa Beach and rolled around in the sand a lot, and that seemed to get me through the sands of Tatooine and all those long hours on the sand. So, um, yes, you have to prepare yourself, um, uh, especially for all the stunt work. It gets a little bit physical, especially by the time you've been there at 5 in the morning. By the time it's 7 at night and you're still fighting, the body starts to uh, to slow up a little bit, and then there's some aches and pains. So we work um, every night, every night, Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday, I train every day, and I take the weekends, uh, the Sunday off, just to have a little bit of a break. Yeah, I mean, the actually, physical... Robert Rodriguez, the director, would come over and train Saturday mornings. We'd have a little bit of a competition, and Robert, my director, uh, it annoyed me so much he could actually outbench me. So we had these two <laughs> ginormous fifties. Then he turned up with hundreds, and I said, "Oh my god!" And his biceps started to get a bit bigger, and I was telling Robert, "Hey, come on, man, who's Boba around here?" You're that, the director. <laughs> that's funny because <laughs> so my, yeah, my now we trained hard. My, we trained hard. My next question is going to be about Robert and, and, and your director because this is clearly a whole physical aspect of preparation, but mentally it, it, it takes some preparation as well. So, what was the creative process like working on a Disney Plus show versus a movie, especially with your director Robert, where you guys are working together and working out together in a whole mental aspect of preparing for this uh, show? Very rarely you have such a very close relationship with a guy like Robert Rodriguez, but we just clicked from the start. He's a cool dude. He's from Austin, Texas. He loves his music. He plays a real good rock guitar. He's got a couple of Van Halens, and, uh, and I'm a guitarist too, so him and I had a lot of fun. We'd be playing the guitar a lot offset. But again, uh, John would be there in the morning. We'd go over the scene. We'd look at all the beats. We'd even watch another movie like a Godfather scene or Lawrence of Arabia. We'd sit down and watch a couple of these old iconic movies. And I loved the Lawrence of Arabia. I loved uh, 
Anthony Quinn and all these old actors. We, uh, we'd watch the, a scene from The Godfather and uh, watch the, the, the Grand Master Marlon Brando perform. So they'd set a wonderful stage. We'd rehearse, get all the beats right. Then John would keep an eye on us all day through these new technical means. And then basically Robert and myself would just have a great day. And sometimes we'd spend too much time jam jamming on our guitars. And the AD would say, come on, Jim, we need you on set. Stop. We got Stop. an artist yeah. here, too. I'm telling you, Tamara, artist. like, I, you know, as a, as a Grammy voter here, I've dropped that all the time. I'm the <laughs> fiddle player. I'll bring if, if you let me hang out with Boba Fett, like I, we're, we're jamming, brother. This is happening. We're making it real. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what gets us through the long hours on the sand, too. We try to have a lot of fun. And, and every now and then you try and work in some, some – I pick a scene sometimes and just try and enjoy myself. Look, I'm not in charge of the writing, and I was just – you know, there's some, some things I'm not in control of. I just thought uh, there were some things that – you know, we wanted to create a, a real tough kind of band, but I think some of the stuff for me was a little bit uh, – making him a little vulnerable, and, and I thought I didn't really enjoy that stuff. So I really got involved in the fight in episode two, which uh, sort of uh, had a little bit more of my influence. And I was able oh, to work yeah. well with our stunt team who keep us safe, uh, Brand X, JJ. They're a great, great stunt team that, uh, you know, always want to do their best and make us look good. So at the same time, when I was saying there's a lot of physical stuff, hey, if things get a bit dangerous, there's always a double on hand. But they had trouble find, trying to find someone uh, as good looking to take my place. So in the end of the day, I had to do my own stunts. <laughs> there's no doubt about <laughs> no, it. We appreciate your energy. We appreciate your work. We appreciate your talent. Thank you so much for joining this us. If you want to watch the book of Boba Fett, sign up for Disney+. Plus. It's easy. New episodes on Wednesday for the best content and entertainment and sports sign up this is so awesome for the disney bundle i just want to get my fiddle and be like come on get me in the band all right i don't know scooby i don't know what i'm doing anymore his energy uh, we're gonna amazing. be together on monday night if you've never watched a digital show monday's a great time to start although no, i don't know why i tell you that here in. as we will be there getting you ready for the college football national championship he's scooby miguez i'm jason fitz Kenny League and producer extraordinaire made this show happen all year round. For everybody Kenny. behind the scenes, thank you so much for the work put into the kickoff presented by Ram Trucks. This is it for us. <laughs> <laughs>